Hi, this is Robert Rapier and this is R-Squared Energy TV. On this week's episode, I've got questions on turning biomass into fuels from two different viewers. First question is, the promise of turning biomass into renewable fuels is appealing, <clears throat> but the choice of which pathway to take is confusing. Are there any trusted pathways to convert biomass into a renewable fuel? Is diesel a better choice than ethanol because of the blend law? So yeah, there are many, many different ways to get from biomass to energy. And there are some tried and true ways. Uh, corn ethanol, obviously, and sugarcane ethanol, turning sugars into fuel is, uh, is commercially practiced today. Biomass to power is commercially practiced today, and that's a pretty straightforward way of making electricity. Uh, cellulose to ethanol is established and has been commercialized, but it's not commercial today. And the reason is just simply too costly. And when you think about corn ethanol, you, you know, you bring the corn in, you get the sugars out pretty easily, and then you ferment it to ethanol. Biomass ethanol, you have to unlock those sugars, and that's an extra step. And you have to break down that cellulose, and you get a lot of byproducts that interfere with the fermentation. And so there's been a lot of issues uh, between that and commercialization. Gasification of biomass is another route that's been done at smaller scale, but nobody has built a large scale plant and actually done it at full scale. Um, <clears throat> one of the, the, the question about drop-in fuels, I think drop-in fuels do have a brighter future. I think right now the largest biofuel plant in the world may be Nesty's plant that they built in Singapore to make drop-in diesel and jet fuel from palm oil. And so that's hydrocrack technology. That is commercially practiced, and that is uh, uh, on a much larger scale than most biofuel plants. They, they use existing refining technology of, of hydro-treating the oil and getting the oxygen out, and they create drop-in diesel. And so uh, I think that is competitive with oil, certainly at $100 a barrel, and uh, that's a technology that I would expect to see growing somewhat going forward. Next question. I recently watched this video from the Wall Street Journal with Vinod Kosla talking about wood chips and cellulosic ethanol. Can you clear up for me what this guy's talking about? As you stated, cellulosic ethanol derives 75% of its energy from fossil fuels. Can you go a little more in depth? And finally, can you comment on the views of this Silicon Valley venture capitalist? It's an interesting question because uh, Sam Avro, the uh, founder of Consumer Energy Report, where my uh, column is hosted, and I were talking about this the other day. Um, the the uh, viewer is referring to an article that appeared in the Wall Street Journal where uh, Daniel Jurgen and Vinod Kosla are both interviewed and there's a question, there's a couple of questions in there that are very telling. One of those is, how many years do you think it will be before half of our global energy production comes from non-fossil fuels? And Jurgen says it's going to be, you know, maybe 2050. Now Kosla says, I'm more optimistic, I'm guessing 25 years. So he's guessing in 25 years, half our global energy production will be non-fossil fuel based. Now, if you contrast that with some of the statements that he's made just a few years ago, that's a dramatic change from where he was, where he was saying that, you know, it, it's, it, it's going to scale up very rapidly and it's going to displace petroleum very quickly. So it seems like he's becoming more uh, realistic about the prospects, even though, you know, he's saying I, he, 25 years, he's being optimistic there. Uh, but then the next question is really significant. Where are we on alternative fuels? What's taking so long? So Vinod says, now th listen to the weasel words in here. The technology development is going fairly well. We're approaching, approaching the point where there are half a dozen technologies that could compete with $100 a barrel oil without subsidies by the time they build their third or fourth plant. So if you go back and you read some of his 2006 articles, he's talking about making ethanol for 90 cents a gallon. He's talking about corn ethanol coming in at that price and that the cellulosic ethanol projects that they're doing are going to be competitive with that. And now he's talking about they're approaching a point, which means we're not there yet, that we could compete with $100 barrel oil. So, so now he's talking about... Uh, uh, you know, much higher prices certainly than the dollar a gallon he was talking about a few years ago by the time they build their third or fourth plant. So a more cynical person might look at that and say, what you really mean is you're nowhere close. I mean, you, you don't have anything that's close to $100 a barrel oil because you're talking about building three or four plants. You're talking well down the road before you're competitive with $100 a barrel oil. 
And then he goes on to state that the problem has not been the technology, it's been the financial crisis, slowed down construction and money and et cetera. So, you know, back to the question, you know, I need more money and then we can make this go faster. Uh, imagine for a second that I'd made my fortune in the oil industry and I went into Silicon Valley and I said, <clears throat> Intel has been ripping consumers off for years. I'm going to make chips at half the price of Intel and I line up a bunch of investors and I actually get the government to kick in some of the money. And then I go out and I build a plant and it fails spectacularly and I just tee off and do it again. Um, you know, people would just laugh at me and say, you had no experience in chips. Why did you think you could come in here and do something that Intel's been doing for years? And yet that's exactly what he's done. He's come in with no experience and it it's looks like now he's becoming more grounded in the reality of the situation, which I said all along that he would, that this would happen. Uh, but he's done this on the taxpayer dime. I mean, taxpayers have funded a lot of his learning curve here, and now we're getting the story that, you know, by the time they build three or four plants, they may compete with a $100 barrel oil. So I've always said, uh, and, and, and he'll say, you know, this, this is the nature of these venture capital investments. You know, uh, nine out of ten will fail and we'll have the one big hit. So he's still waiting for that one big hit. And, I, you know, I don't begrudge him, you know, what he's trying to do, but I, do, I don't think as a taxpayer I should be funding any part of that experiment from somebody who doesn't have any experience in this industry at all. So um, um, oh, back, to the, back to the question. So what is he talking about? Um, you know, the range fuels thing was biofuels from, from wood chips. That was gasification into biofuels. Um, now he's got certain, he's got some other ventures, you know, he's taken uh, Kior Public and that is a different route, but that's, um, that's wood chips to, you make pyrolysis oil out of them and then the pyrolysis oil has to be upgraded. And so that's one of those technologies I think he's looking at and saying by the time we get three or four plants built, we might be able to compete with $100 a hundred-dollar barrel oil. So, uh, uh, and, and the other person there, it's interesting, Daniel Jurgen. he was there with Daniel Jurgen. So Coastal has been very, very optimistic about the, the possibility of biofuels to scale up and out of, out of cellulose and displace large quantities of oil. Jurgen believes that we've got plenty of oil and there's going to be no oil issues forever. And he's, he's projecting, you know, growing oil and that we're only 20% through our oil endowment. So these guys are both optimists. They're just coming at it from very different uh, points of view. Uh, I'd encourage you to, uh, to look up that interview because uh, it's, it's quite eye-opening where Coastla's position has, has evolved to. So uh, with that, I guess that's, that's the end of this week's episode. Look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you.